What's up, guys? Welcome back to Checkerboard Chat, the official sports podcast of the Daily Beacon. I'm Blake Von Hagen, the sports editor. He's Will Backus, the assistant sports editor. We're here with Corey Sanning and Noah Taylor. We're going to talk about the Tennessee men's basketball team going to the Sweet 16, and we're going to talk about the Lady Ball season coming to an end. I will right, we'll start off with the Lady Balls. Uh, their season is over now. They lost in the tournament, so there's some news kind of surrounding Holly Warlick's situation right now. You want to kind of talk about that and what's going on there? Well, right now, as it stands, it's a lot of rumor, but there's been a lot of speculation that you know she's probably going to be out at this point, um, and it really wouldn't be surprising. This you could argue was the worst season in the team's history, at least the worst season in over 30 years. So. Um, she's, you know, she's been here for a while, and I guess you could, I mean, it, it's not an argument to say that she has underachieved in her time, but, yeah, there's been a lot of rumors floating around that she's been fired. A lot of people say that there's sources saying that she's out, or at least that she met with Philip Fulmer, and, uh, you know, in that aspect, the writing is kind of on the wall. Interestingly enough, um, Gene Henley reported earlier that apparently Tennessee was going to hire Jeff Waltz to replace her, even though she hasn't actually been fired yet. Uh, Jeff Waltz from Louisville, who has Louisville in the Sweet 16 right now. He's t- brought them to, I think, three Final Fours and a couple of national championship appearances. So that would be a home run hire, but we don't even know for sure if Holly's out yet. And today is Tuesday afternoon when we're filming, so that's kind of the timeline we're looking at. By the time this is posted, uh, it could be different news about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought going into the – I thought making the tournament saved her job, but uh, – Losing the way that they did in that game uh, definitely didn't help. And now with the news today, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. And like Will said, if, if Jeff Waltz is the guy, I mean, that's an amazing hire by Philip Fulmer. We were talking before the show that um, that would be his biggest hire, probably, as far as name recognition goes, if, uh, if that's who they get. So, yeah, I guess something to keep an eye on for now. We might even know by the end of the show. So. Yeah, the Lady Vols lost to UCLA in that first round game. 12 point loss. Um, there's some interesting history about losing in the first round for the Lady Vols. You know, it's the first time it's happened in a long time. Kind of take us through uh, the history behind that and then what happened in that game. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time they lost in the first round since 2009. And I saw an interesting ESPN article about that. It said that in 2009 it was surprising that Tennessee lost in the first round because it wasn't upset. But at this point, it wasn't very surprising they lost in the first round because UCLA is a team that. Um, just advanced their fourth Sweet 16 appearance in a row. So, and Lady Balls were five and a half point underdogs in that yeah, game, so yeah. they were expected to lose. Going but I in. think that's kind of like a good, a good show of the state the program is in right now. That it's not surprising that Tennessee lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Although this is just the second time in the team's history that they've lost in the first round, and the first time in ten years. That kind of shows what state the program's in. It was also, I think. I don't, I'm not sure if it was their lowest seed in history, but it certainly was one of their lowest and definitely one of their lowest in very recent memory. So, um, But, yeah, they just kind of didn't show a lot of energy and fight, especially to start the game. I believe UCLA, UCLA jumped out to like a 28-5 to five lead to start the game. or It wasn't that bad, but it was bad. They had a 25-point lead at, some point, at one point. Tennessee kind of cut it down at halftime. They actually got to the point where they led 59-58, and from that point they kind of let it slip away back into UCLA's hands to close the game. They turned the ball over way too much. That's kind of been one of the biggest uh, criticisms so far this year is that they turned the ball over too much, 15 turnovers a game. They had seven in the first quarter alone, and that's how they got down big early. But for a while, it kind of looked like they captured momentum back. They got a lead. They held a lead for a good amount of time uh, late in the third quarter and early in the fourth, but it just slipped away from the end, and it didn't honestly look like they were playing with a ton of effort. A lot of interesting comments were made after the game too. Uh, Vina Westbrook was asked about, you know, what kind of changes need to be made, or you know, where do they go from here? And she said that pretty much that changes need to be made to the coaching staff and off the court. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that because it was an emotional moment right after the game in the open locker room. So, you know, she could have just been angry at that point, but it was definitely an interesting comment made. Yeah, I kind of thought going into this game with the way Tennessee played from the end of the regular season against Ole Miss through the SEC tournament that they had a chance to beat UCLA. I know they were an underdog in that game, but I thought they had a chance to play for some pride, make it to that second round, and then ultimately lose to Maryland. But um, like Will said, when you talk about the energy they displayed, I mean, we saw it against South Carolina earlier this year. I mean, it's like too little, too late. You know, teams come out and they go on these big runs in Tennessee struggling to, to you know, hang in there like they don't want to be there. 
And then by the time that they start trying to come back, this game obviously was a little bit closer as Tennessee actually took the lead late. But, um, yeah, I mean, and then you hear those comments after the game from Ravina Westbrook, and then it's no mystery that these this team clearly wasn't in that game. Their head wasn't in it. And uh, so I guess we'll see from here what happens. But it, it clearly a recipe that they've you know followed all year, it seemed like, uh, just not getting into the game when they should and it costing them ultimately. You mentioned the Lady Vols being down a bunch of points early in that game. We'll kind of shift gears here, talk about the, the men's team. Uh, Tennessee was up 25 and, and just about tied the largest uh, lead given up in an NCAA tournament game. Iowa came storming back. They ended up tying the game. Uh, Tennessee, in overtime, hangs on and wins that game. Uh, the game before that against Colgate, Tennessee also kind of came out of the second half slow. Uh, the Colgate came back. Uh, a lot of that was just hot shooting from a, a guy that just he, he got on fire and Tennessee couldn't really slow him down. He was hitting shots that even after the game, Lamonte Turner said, I blocked one of his shots and it still went in. And then he banked another one in right after that at the very end of the game. Uh, but in the second half there, Tennessee in back-to-back games gave up leads um, and almost let the opponent come back. And that's something now they're in the Sweet 16. Can't let that hap- happen going forward because these teams are going to be really good and that's not gonna, it's not going to work if you give up leads like that. So what did you see from those two games and, and what led to those uh, leads being blown? Well, I mean, it was just the lethargic starts in the second half, and it's a problem that we, you know, discussed for the past month, it seems. You know, it, you know, when they went down to LSU, they had a nine-point lead with six minutes to go. You know, if they win that game, maybe they take, you know, the SEC regular season championship. Same thing happened when they, uh, you know, when you said against Colgate, against Auburn. You know, they, they battled hard in the second half, and, you know, Auburn came out on fire in the second half in the title game, took it to them. I'm not sure if it's uh, as much to do with effort as it is to do with the fact that I, it really appears like they're relaxing when they come out. It feels like, especially when, you know, given you go up and you go into the halftime with a 20-point lead against an inferior team in Iowa, you think you should have that in the bag. That's what I, that's the impression that I got. And, you know, under, you know, with a Rick, being Rick Barnes, you know, the coach of this team, that's really head-scratching given how hard the staff is on these guys, you know, how hard they do go at, you know, with training and training, you know, in practice. You know, they are always giving their all 100% of the time in the second half, so it doesn't seem like that's been the case until the very end when they have to turn it on, and luckily for them, they've been able to so far. You look at the box scores in those games, maybe outside of the Auburn game, which that probably was some pretty bad defense, but I think a lot of it has been just the offense is slowing down, and they're not keeping up the pace they had in the first half. They're not pushing the ball. They're not trying to score. Mm-hmm. I mean, it felt like that Iowa game, at one point, they went. it seemed like they went like three or four minutes without even getting a shot off, and they were just turning the ball over, uh, you know, losing the ball, steals, all that kind of stuff it was was happening and, and they weren't getting any shots up because they were playing a different style than they were the, in the first half, which gave them that lead to start with. And I thought it was interesting after the game, Kyle Alexander said, uh, after the Iowa game, he said, it felt like we were playing not to lose rather than to win. When you're looking up the scoreboard and you see that lead, you know, it's getting cut down, it's getting cut down. Uh, you're, you start playing, you know, I want, we want to preserve this lead rather than we need to build the lead. And, and that can lead to what we saw in that Iowa game. So, yeah, I think that it's got to be the offense has to – they have to maintain the offense coming out of the break. And yeah, keep staying in attack mode. When you're playing this week, they've got Purdue coming up. Carson Edwards is, is a guy that's going to score a lot of points. He averages 23 a game. So if, if they come out like that in the second half, he'll definitely get going. Uh, that's something we've seen from him all season. So they'll have to do something different. Uh, this week, but the good news is they advanced, and that's all that yep. matters in March is, is you advance. Um, Lady Balls did not advance, so we'll take a little time now to dive back into the post-game comments. <laughs> there, you guys didn't really mention the Holly Warlick's comments. Uh, you guys saw the that press conference. What did you think of her comments after the game? Did it seem like they were, they were comments of somebody that was you know the, she could see the writing on the wall? I mean, what did you see? What did you think of her comments after the game? I mean, she was asked pretty much up front about her future with. Tennessee and she didn't really confirm or deny that she was going to be coming back she just said that she's enjoyed coaching here and that you know no matter what she'll still love the program Um, she said it's really not in her hands at this point what her future is you know she said that she'd obviously love to continue coaching as almost anybody in that position would Uh, she you pointed this out a little bit before the show but I guess she kind of talked to like someone who maybe at least has come to grips with the fact that this may be their last season here just from the way she talked and the way she carried herself she talked a lot about um not necessarily her career someone asked her like um i i don't remember exactly how the question was phrased but it was pretty much like what she's been proud of while she was here and she didn't necessarily talk about her career she just talked about the future and she was she said you know she just loves this program she loves how much it cares for women's basketball so 
it kind of sounded like maybe she knew like she was she knew she was on the way out but again it's just kind of speculation at this point yeah i feel like covering holly this year there were a couple different times where throughout the season where that question wasn't asked the way it was on saturday but you know people went around it and kind of alluded to hey are you coaching for your job here you know what do you think of the situation and she would kind of shut it down i feel like um but that wasn't the case on saturday and i think that she was talking like somebody that knows that either maybe she knows already or she knows that it's probably going to happen i mean they didn't live up to, to expectations this year and it's something that's been kind of gradual so yeah i think she she saw the writing on the wall and, and is kind of prepared for whatever happens and uh but and plus what avina said kind of tells me that she knows something too or thinks that something should be done which isn't a good look either so yeah i'd have to agree and you guys mentioned gene henley from the chattanooga times for press he, he mentioned a report um about louisville said coach possibly taking this job obviously they've got a game coming up this week they're in the sweet 16 uh so not the ideal timing from their standpoint but if that were to happen uh maybe on a scale of one to ten what what kind of grade would you give that higher if holly is going to be replaced i mean it would be a home run i'd say it's you know eight to ten he's he's probably the best realistic option they have and i didn't even think he was a realistic option until i saw that i think you know he's one of the five best coaches right now you could argue that but just outside of getting Gino from UConn and Muffet McGraw from Notre Dame, which neither of those are going to happen, he's probably one of the best hires you can get. I was thinking they would go for someone that was like a former player that maybe doesn't have coaching experience or even uh, Becky Hamilton from the NBA who's on the Spurs staff right now, someone like that. But the fact that they could get Jeff Waltz, who's 330 and 90 all time, he's taken Louisville to multiple tournaments. Like I said, I think three Final Fours and two uh, – national championship appearances he hasn't won a national championship with them but still just his resume speaks volumes and I think they're 31 and 3 right now like you said going to the sweet 16 against Oregon State um, they should advance maybe further they're definitely a team that is always in talks to be a national title contender they're one of you know the Louisville he's turned Louisville into one of the best programs in the nation so it would definitely be a home run hire for Tennessee that would kind of rectify all the wrongs of this season if he was hired because you'd expect him with the level of talent that Tennessee has on the roster supposedly has on the roster he could transform Tennessee into a team that's in the national title contention in his first year because it's not like he's got a program to rebuild from from ground up I mean Holly isn't necessarily leaving this program in shambles she's gotten plenty of talent here she's got plenty of talent coming in so with Waltz's coaching they could be, you know, like I said, in national talks in the first year of his tenure. And his first step would be to retain those recruits and, and hope that he can get them to come here anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think it didn't take long into the conference slate for us to kind of hear this talk about the possibility of Tennessee being without Holly Warlick at the end of the season. So it's been going on in a while, and a lot of names have been thrown out there. And out of that list of names, Jeff Walls would be one of the guys I would have said, no way. You know, I would have put him up there with Geno and Muffet McGraw and, and names like that. But uh, with this news, yeah, absolutely, it would be 100% the best hire you could make. And I would have thought, you know, maybe an up-and-comer, maybe somebody that played here uh, from a, you know, a mid-major. But absolutely, if they can get this, with the accolades speak for themselves, like Will said, the, some of the things that he's been, I think they were in a Final Four last year too. And so, um, yeah, Philip Fulmer, I mean, he, he hasn't had to make a huge hire besides football. A uh, huge hire since Jeremy Pruitt, and this will probably be the biggest name that he could possibly get. All right, we'll kind of wrap up here, spend the rest of the time talking about the team that is still playing, uh, <laughs> the men's team. Uh, they've got, obviously, like we said, Purdue coming up this week. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of maybe, I, I mean, I mentioned him earlier, so maybe I'm, I'm part of that, but it's not just Carson Edwards on this Purdue team. He's the guy that stands out. Uh, he, he averages almost twice as many points as their second leading scorer. But they do have guys, uh, Ryan Klein and Grady Eifert, those guys can hit threes too if you leave them open. And that's been a problem for Tennessee this year is guarding the three ball, especially teams that have multiple guys. I saw Colgate do it, essentially one guy doing it. But uh, they're not going to be able to just double team Carson Edwards on the perimeter because they'll kick it out and they'll hit threes. They'll have other guys that can hit threes. So I, I do think that maybe uh, that's more challenging than people expect. Also, I hear a lot of people really confident that Tennessee will win this game. They are only a one-point favorite, so this is essentially a toss-up game uh, for Tennessee. What do you think are the keys for Tennessee in this game? You know, obviously well, defending the perimeter is one of them. 
Well, yeah, you referred to it there. I think defending the perimeter is the top key because it's something that Tennessee hasn't done well in the past, what, and really the, the last half of conference play, they haven't defended the three-point line well. And in today's basketball, which is all about, you know, space and pace, getting down the floor, you know, quick, getting out, out kicking out to the open threes, you know, in the corners and stuff, Carson Edwards is going to draw a lot of attention on that floor. And like you said, he draw a double, triple team, he's going to kick it out and they're going to have a wide open shooter somewhere. You know, if you send a double team, somebody's going to be left open. So I think the defending the perimeter, they have to keep, you know, Rick Barnes and Rob Linear, I think they have to figure out a way to get them to come out of the locker room more energized because, you know, if you come out lethargic and you don't, you know, you don't try to get good shots, you know, you're not attacking the basket like they usually do, not giving Grant Williams a lot of touches in the post or even giving Admiral touches in the post give it, even though he's transferred fully out to now a guard. But I think they have to, you know, they got to cut out the lethargic starts the second half. They have to defend the, defend the perimeter. And I think just coming, it comes down to it. They have to play their game. You can't play, but you can't tailor your game to the opposition and think they're going to win, especially not at this time of the year. Yeah, Carson Edwards scored 42 in their uh, round of 32 game. After UT's game, uh, Lamonte Turner said that's not going to happen because he's going to be guarding him, and, and he wants mm -hmm. that matchup. So, and these two teams played back in 2017. Tennessee won that game in overtime. So Lamonte wants that matchup. I don't know if it's the smartest thing to go on record saying that uh, to a guy <laughs> no. like Carson Edwards. Uh, a guy that you know you don't want to chip on his shoulder he's already filling it up um, exactly but I do think down low I think Tennessee does have an advantage in this game because their big guy Matt Harms he's a guy that's really skinny and we've seen the, and, and he's not the strongest guy either uh, especially upper body and we've seen Kyle Alexander his struggles have come against the bigger meteor guys and so I think that um, that could be a good matchup along with Grant Williams I, I do think Tennessee has a real advantage there so then you kind of look at, do twos beat threes in college basketball now? And especially when Tennessee has gone through stretches where they've played really bad on offense, I don't think they can afford to do that this game. If they play a good 40 minutes of basketball, I think Tennessee will win. But if, if they come out slow, even for five, six minutes, then uh, I think Purdue will win the game. What, what's kind of your prediction for the game? Then we'll, we'll get you guys a Well, I, I, you know, honestly, you and I really saw eye to eye a lot in this season. I'm going to go with you right there. Tennessee needs to put a, you know, their A game out for 40 minutes. They haven't done that in quite a long time. You know, if they do that, they probably think they'll be able to squeak out with a close victory. But like you said, if they go for a three to six minute stretch where they're not playing their game offensively, they're trying to, you know, defend Purdue's, you know, playmakers could be a rough night. I think Tennessee wins, but at the end of the day, if it goes the other way and Tennessee struggles in the second half, I would not be surprised if they come out with a, another gut wrench, gut wrenching into the season. Yeah, I'm going to assume that Tennessee's leadership uh, shows up this time and that they've kind of learned from these first two games in the tournament. So I will pick Tennessee officially to win. Same. Uh, but if they go through one of those stretches, yeah, I agree that they're not going to win if they go through one of those stretches. What do you guys think about this game? I think Purdue's a really scary matchup for Tennessee just because of the threat that they pose outside. And then you've got Carson Edwards. He's going to draw double, maybe even triple teams every time he drives in. So, again, you mentioned those guys on the outside that can still hit shots. Tennessee has really not defended the dribble drive at all this year. Well, that's how teams have torn them up. Either that or teams have gotten hot. And when Carson Edwards gets hot, you could argue he's probably one of the best players in the nation, if not the best player in the nation. So Purdue's a very scary matchup for Tennessee, but... I think Tennessee has faced a lot of heartbreak this year with the loss to Auburn in the SEC title game, almost dropping the you know couple NCAA tournament games that they played. I feel like they they're going to use those experiences maybe to put together a complete 40-minute game. Of course, you can never tell, but yeah, if they do that, then I think they win. It won't be a comfortable win. I think it'll be a very close game, but uh, if they can play a complete game, I think they'll win.